Welcome to church. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are gracious, God, Lord. We thank you for all that you are. You're just so magnificent and mighty and strong, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, your Holy Spirit guides us. It unlocks truth that we would not understand um, just on our own, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for your your, your word, God, that we have this word that we can hide in our hearts, that we can hold in our hands and, and just put to application each and every day of our life. Lord, thank you for this guide that we have, Lord. Um, and thank you for uh, the, the body of Christ, Lord, that we have each other um, to rely on each other. We can help each other um, and that you're always in the midst of us, Lord. We thank you for that. Jesus, I pray, God, that your spirit would just come in to this uh, room today, God, and all the Sunday school classrooms, you bless the teachers and the students, Lord. Bless this, uh, the sermon that goes forth, Lord. Bless your word, God. It is, a, it is a living word, and I pray, God, that it would liven up your people, Lord Jesus, that it would awaken us, Lord, to, uh, to a new walk with you today, this very day. Lord, let your Holy Spirit breathe into us the breath of life and um, just let there be, let this church uh, just rise up today, Lord Jesus, and worship you and give you all glory in all things. We thank you for this opportunity to teach your word and to, to be a part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. All right, welcome to the Search for T Truth Bible Study. Um, this is a Bible study on how to teach Bible studies. So if you're interested in doing a Bible study with someone or you, you know someone who's wanting a Bible study, um, this is great information that you can get your hands on and you can help someone um, learn about God, learn about the Bible, and uh, strengthen their walk um, with Him. Last week we talked about, I'm, I'm Brother Chad Wilson, if you don't know, those of you online, if you're new um, to Abundant Life. Um, we want to welcome you, not only online, but we want to welcome you into the house of the Lord today. But anyway, last week we talked about uh, the birth of Jesus and the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about um, how Jesus' parents had brought him up uh, uh, into uh, the type of political and religious environment that he was surrounded by and how he was dealing with all that. And then we also talked about uh, when Jesus started his ministry at the age of 12. He was pre um, teaching uh, learned doctors, rabbis, and, and uh, philosophical people. He was sitting in the midst of them, teaching them, which was pretty amazing. And we talked about his baptism, and that's kind of where we left off last week. <clears throat> Today, we're going to continue on that uh, on this journey in the New Testament. Um, so anyway, so Jesus' ministry has begun, and we haven't really gotten much into that yet, but Luke chapter 4, 1 through 13, it says this, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. So immediately after Jesus' baptism, he's led into the wilderness, wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And this reminds me of the time when, when, uh, when I had decided to finally submit myself to God and commit my life to learning about the Bible. I don't ever remember the devil attacking me before then. I don't remember that life. I mean, when I wasn't going to church, I don't even, I can't even recall one time when I knew that the devil was attacking me. But once I had committed and submitted myself to him and I got baptized at a church in Louisville, Texas, immediately, I mean immediately, when I say immediately, I mean like when I left that church after that service, I started getting attacked. And then what do, I, what do I mean by that? I meant in my mind, because this is where the spiritual warfare takes place in, in a lot of our lives is in our minds. In my mind, my experience, what I had just experienced in baptism was false. That's what, I, that's what my mind was, had started to tell me. 
And I soon realized, thankfully, there was people surrounding me telling me that, hey, you're going to be attacked by just be, beware because you're, the devil, the enemy is going to come against you and try to stop you because it see, he sees what you're trying to do. And when Jesus had been baptized and he was taken to the wilderness, into the wilderness, he was alone. But then the tempter comes to him and immediately begins attacking him and trying to disrupt his plan, trying to uh, take away his experience that he had had, okay? And this is what the devil wants to do to all of us. And this happens all the time. It happens in our daily walk. Every time we have a good experience with God, the devil hates that. He hates to see you with joy. He hates to see you with peace. He hates to see you with um, a, a growing understanding of his word because that endangers everything the devil's trying to do. He's trying to steal your soul and you're fighting against it because you're wanting to live for God. So there's this constant warfare. So Jesus is taken up or taken to the wilderness and he goes, endures three temptations from from Satan. And uh, the devil really, all his, his priority was to see if, if Jesus would accept some other substitute plan, some other, uh, some other way around the cross, you know, just bypass that little section of eternity. That's what the devil wanted to do was to get Jesus to bypass that plan. And that's what the devil tries to do to us. Come on, just accept this. This is a better way. If you just do this, you know, he tries, to, he does it in a subtle way. So subtle sometimes we don't even realize what we're doing. But Jesus knew the kind of Messiah that the Jews were expecting. And he also knew that they would reject him uh, when he failed to meet their expectations. But God's way has always been the way of the cross or death to self. That's always been his way. And man has always tried to have substitute ways to eliminate or bypass God's way. So the first temptation, Matthew 4, 1 through 4. I just read uh, the first three scriptures, but I'll start at verse 3. And the devil said to him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Praise the Lord. So Jesus could have used a supernatural uh, a phenomenon right there. He could have said, okay, boom, stone turns into bread, takes a bite of bread, bypass his way. He did it his way, right? He could have done that, but he didn't. Jesus the first thing he did was revert back to God's word. God's word should always be our go-to. When the devil attacks you, a lot, what a lot of people try to do is they try to fight him on their own. They try to just go into warfare. They're not armored. They don't have any weapon. They're just going into battle with nothing. I mean, even David had five stones, even though he knew it was only going to take one. But... We, when we go to battle with our enemy, we have to have some kind of armor, some kind of weapon with us so that we can defeat our enemy. It's just common sense, right? So when the devil starts attacking you, before you, before you get up and face your enemy, you need to uh, go directly to God's word. That's the sword. That's the sword that we, that we need to rely on. Go to God's word. That's what Jesus did said it is written so so he could have used supernatural power to uh to to do many things jesus could have he could have turned all the stones into bread there wouldn't be any more world hunger he could have just solved that problem right there right but he can do anything um but they uh in if, no doubt, he, these thoughts might have entered his mind as well as the thought of uh, appeasing his personal hunger. He was fasting for 40 days. We just got off a of fast, and uh, I particularly don't enjoy fasting. 
Um, but I learned a lot through that experience. But it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Can you imagine going 40 days without food? Without food. That's what Jesus did. And so he no doubt he was very hungry. So Jesus answered Satan with the scripture that man shall not live by bread alone, but by shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's just a, that's a powerful example of what Jesus gave us in his word. Rely upon the word of God. And that's an important a point to get across to your students when you're doing your Bible study, always remind them, God's Word. Rely on God's Word. It's the go-to. Go back to it. Um, if you don't understand something, go back and review, research. You know, Go back to the Word. Always. So then, then he's tempted a second time. <clears throat> the second temptation was for him to throw himself down from the temple if he were the Son of God. Let's read this, Matthew 4, 5, and 7. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him, unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that, is, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Okay. And then, yeah, verse 7. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. So wow, all the kingdoms, he's shown all these kingdoms in a split second. This could be all yours. It was already his. <laughs> he already owns it. He owns everything. And the devil is trying to take something that somebody else owns and resell it. He's trying to take somebody else's property and, and act like it's his own and give it to somebody else. See what he, this is what the devil does. He tries to take something, he's, he's done that for, since the garden. He's taken what God made, he uh, disrupts everything by changing God's word, by manipulating people into thinking, well, this is, doesn't belong to God, this is mine, and I'm, I'm going to give it to you if you bow down and worship me. That's the way that the devil, the devil works. He's always worked that way. He's sly. He's evil. He wants to make you think that God doesn't care about you. God doesn't love you. God does care about you, and God does love you. And he wants you to have an abundant life. He wants you to have a joyful a life full of joy and peace. He doesn't want us to suffer or anything like that. So remind your students that God loves, God loves them no matter what. And they're we all make mistakes. We all fall. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know what scripture it is, but a, it says something about a righteous man uh, falleth seven times but gets back up. And when we fall, if we get back up, God's going to be there with us. He's willing to forgive us. He's willing to work with us and make us more like him. So remind your students that. All right, so he, uh, so Jesus answered. This is how he answered. Jesus answered again with the word of God. In verse 8, he says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Get thee behind me, Satan. Amen. That's power. That's God telling the devil, get out of here. You know, God's given us that power. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we can rebuke devils. We can cast out devils out of people with his power. It's not anything that we can do. We don't have that power as hum human beings. We absolutely do not have the power to do anything like that. But with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost in us, and the power of Jesus' name, we can do anything because he is our God. Amen. And to get that point across to someone when, when they're dealing with struggles in their life, because no doubt that's why they're there in your Bible study is they're, they're struggling with something. They're struggling with life, relationships, whatever. 
and they need some kind of something that they can go to 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 get power to overcome their their problems. So remind them, Jesus is your power. He is your superpower. Rely on him. Amen. And and you call out his name. If something's coming against you, rebuke it in Jesus' name. And if it doesn't go away immediately, do it again. Keep doing it. Keep fighting. Keep uh, just uh, proclaiming that name of Jesus out loud. Do it out loud. Don't let the devil beat you down. Don't let the devil uh, take away your joy and steal things from you. The only power I believe the devil has is the power we give him. I don't think he has any power. Only what we give him, what we allot to him in our life. So we just say, you have no power in my life, Satan. Get thee behind me right now in Jesus' name. Amen? And do it with, I used, I used to teach high school. And uh, students would come in, and I'd always do this. And students would expect it. Like when I, uh, a, a student would, a high school student would come in late to class. They always have a pass, you know, but they'd come in my classroom and they'd sit down and act like, they'd put the pass on my desk and sit down like nothing's wrong. And all the other students would be looking around like, here goes Wilson. And I'd say, Brittany, where you been? Why are you late coming to my class? I'd get this facial expression on like I'm really mad, which I'm not. To totally, Joe. I never, hardly ever got mad at my students. But I would, I'd just make them like, I'm sorry. You know, that's the way we need to be with the devil. Just tell him, get out of here right now in Jesus' name. You don't belong here. Not in my life, in my family's life, in my home, in this church, nowhere. Get out of here, Satan. Just be forceful. Take control. You know, be, you're a child of the king. You know, we don't, we don't need to be playing footsies with the devil or allowing him any foothold or in, in our life at all. Just kick him out. If he's in, if you sense him in your children, in your home, go home today and kick him out in Jesus' name. Do it. As soon as you walk through that threshold, say, get out of here, Satan, in Jesus' name. You know, kick him out of your vehicle. You're the boss. You're a child of the king. He's given you the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Giving you power. He's given you the power to cast out devils, is what the Bible says. All right, on, on to the next temptation. Um, I must have, I think I skipped one, didn't I? All right. So, no, I didn't, did I? Um, so that, I did all three. Huh. Wow, anyway. His plan was to establish God's kingdom in the hearts of men, relying not on the weapons of political or material strength, but on the power of truth and love. God's plan for us is to rely on truth and love, and that's his word and the Holy Spirit. So we need to rely on that. The plan he chose to follow would be slow in producing results. So Jesus is beginning his ministry, and as we read through the Bible, we realize all the things that him and the disciples are doing is slow it's methodical everything just taking time we want to see results right now sometimes that just doesn't happen so when we're doing a ministry we're helping people and we want to see we want to see results right now that's just not the way it works i mean god yeah he can do a miracle right now and you can you know i've heard people say that people's arms are grown out whatever Eyes opened up and all that. Those are miracles that can happen, of course. But when we're talking about people's lives, uh, joy being restored to their lives and happiness and peace, those things are going to take time. And it takes a partnership. It takes a partnership, not only with the church members, but with God. If people don't rely on God, it's going to take a while. 
because they're going to be up and down, up and down. You know, you know, you ever been on that roller coaster with God? Where you rely on God when you're really down low, you're relying upon him, and then he does something for you and everything's good, but then something else happens, you're down here again, relying on God. It's just a roller coaster. We need to be relying on God no even when things are good or even when things are bad. Just rely on him. Let things take their course. Just pray, read your Bible, trust in him. Everything's going to happen in his way. Amen? So trust in him no matter what. He must... Uh, all right, so a little bit of change of pace here, but political, during the G times of Jesus, and I've already talked about this in a previous study, but there was a lot of political unrest, a lot of religious um, division going on between Sadducees and Pharisees, and there was a Sanhedrin, and all these different uh, groups of people trying to have power. Um, and this was happening during Jesus' time day so this is something he would have to deal with and a lot of these people like the pharisees all these people these were people that were supposed to be worshiping god trusting in him these were the religious leaders of the day and yet they had all they had done all they seem to have done is just fall upon human traditions fall back on and follow traditions you get so caught up in traditions, that's the way. That's the way you got to do, because this is the way my father did it, and my grandfather and his father before him. So we've got to do this, because it's just the way of the family, whatever. I mean, some traditions are great, but when, it, when your walk with God is based on a tradition, you need to be careful, right? You need to be careful, because God's not... He's not uh, a traditional God. He changes things. Like our hearts, for instance. He changes things. He doesn't want us to be the same that we were yesterday. He wants us always to be growing, to be moving ahead, moving forward, moving away from the world moving toward him. And that, that uh, inquire, uh, requires change. Okay. So Jesus must change the concept of his kingdom in the people's minds from a natural one to a spiritual one. So, and he has to remove all these traditions over 1,000 years old from the minds of his followers. His next step was to gather around him a faithful group of followers who would be able to carry on his work after his crucifixion and to plant in their minds principles of living based on love and not on force. So it was time for Jesus to begin the great task before him. So now we get into the, uh, <clears throat> the ministry. I'm going to see if I can change the slide. It's not changing, sister. I don't know. Christ's early ministry... No, nope, that's the wrong. That's the wrong way. I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> anyway, so Jesus's ministry. One of the first things he does was enlist disciples. <clears throat> so he chooses twelve disciples. So he he staked, staked his whole cause on twelve men. He didn't write any books. He didn't leave any elaborate church government. He didn't establish any kind of school for philosophy. He organized no great armies to carry out his or carry his banners to carry out his um, wishes. All he did was gather twelve men. Twelve men, and these were mostly outdoorsmen. These were uh, fishermen. These were uh, farmers. These were small government officials. There were. They weren't any high and mighty people with him. These were men who knew Jesus. They were the men upon whom our Lord depended so heavily for the future. And these were, as we know them, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, 
James, Jude, Simon, and then the one that betrayed him, Judas Iscariot. So he has these 12 men. They're going with him. And um, during Jesus' ministry, he used two main means of, uh, to attract people. One was miracles, and the other was his teaching. Jesus' miracles excited the widest attention among the people. His miracles fall into three classes. Thank you, sister. <clears throat> yep. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. So three classes, those in the sphere of nature, those where he displayed authority over disease and death, and those where he controlled demons. And I believe God has given us the power to do these same types of miracles today. Those that are in the nature, those that are over to overcome disease and um, uh, human ailment, and then those that were uh, given authority to control demons. So the miracle wrought on nature included the turning of the water into wine, the multiplying of the loaves and fishes, and the stilling of the storm when the disciples were in the, the boat. The very first miracle uh, was when he turned the water into wine. Jesus did, uh, what Jesus did at this marriage is typical of his conduct throughout his entire ministry. Whenever he receives an in invitation to someone's home, he always accepts it. If you invite Jesus into your home, he will be there. If you invite Jesus into this place today, he will be here. If you invite him into your heart, into your, this home, we, this body is the temple of God. The scripture tells us this is the temple of the Holy Ghost right here. If we invite him in, he will be there. Jesus loves us. He wants to be where we are. He wants to be a part of our lives. So he always accepts our invitation. Jesus was always interested in ordinary folk and in their ordinary joys and sorrows. And I think that's an interesting statement because ordinary, what is ordinary? To me, ordinary is someone who's humble, someone who's willing to set everything aside and believe in him. Someone who's willing to set their pride and their ego aside and say, Jesus, I am nothing without you. That, to me, is ordinary. And then there's the high-minded people who are too prideful to let go of the things they think they are and serve a wonderful God. You know. And then there's the people that don't under fully understand or haven't they're, they're, they're kind of on the fence. They're leaning. They, they kind of believe some of it, but then they don't believe all, you know, all of it. You know, they're just on the fence. And, uh, but I want to be someone who is ordinary. I just want to, I want to live, I want to be humble before God. Don't you? Don't you want to be that kind of person? Amen. So he was, interested, he was interested in this bride and groom at this wedding, and when an embarrassment arose because the bridegroom was too poor to furnish a sufficient quantity of refreshments, Jesus came to the rescue. Wine was a part of the daily diet of that time, and this first miracle was performed just to save the bridegroom from embarrassment. So, however, the servants, and this is pretty cool too, because if you, if you read that whole section of Scripture, it Jesus did something, but someone else had to do something too. And in, in order for a relationship to work, both parties have to do something. In order for a marriage to work, husband and wife, the, both the husband and wife have to do something in that relationship for it to work. If it's one-sided, it's not going to work. It's not going to last. So, But Jesus wanted to do something great, and he, he did something great. But it wouldn't have happened. I mean, he, he could have made it happen anyway, but he made it so that s someone else had to do something for the miracle to work. And the servants had to go gather water pots, and they had to bring them to the governor of the feast. So 
He said to the bridegroom um, in amazement, every man, this is John chapter 2, verse 10, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, then that which is worse, then they save the worst for last. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. So this is this this whole the way they did this was altogether out of the ordinary, and basically this is what, how the world works. Um, it's always the world always wants to give its best first, but the thrill soon grows less and less over the passing years, and this is how a lot of uh, a lot of people come to God. I remember when. When uh, I first walked into Pentecostal church, not, well, I was, the first time I was, like, I'm not never coming back, but <laughs> it, it freaked me out a little bit. Uh, but when I did go back the next time, I, uh, when I, when I didn't get the Holy Ghost right away, but I knew there was something there, and suddenly God was just putting this burden in my heart, and I wanted, I wanted to, seek him out. I mean, there was a fire in me. I was just running aisles, jumping over seats. I was doing everything that scared me the first time I went. <laughs> so here I was running around aisles, just a uh, 21 years old dude, running around crazy. Blah, blah. You know, I haven't done that for a long time. And that's the way a lot of us, our, our walk with God a lot of us um, do the same thing. We're really on fire, inspired by the Word of God. You know, we want to do this and that. I was teaching Bible studies, and I didn't even know the whole Word yet. I was, I was gung ho for God, and and over the years that's waned. That has, I mean, I still want to serve God, but that fire is not as it once was, you know. And a lot of times that can happen to us. Our fire can dim down. We give the best at the beginning, but then we, it just starts to taper down, and we're just not on fire. And I think that's what pastors trying to been trying to instill in us is get that fire, rekindle it, you know. And you have to do it for yourself. You can't. No one else can do it for you. Of course, you have to seek out that fire. Get, you know, don't let it be quenched in your life. You know. And I don't know what that means for you or, for, you know, each individual person, but whatever we have to do to get that fire back. We're going to a men's conference this, this weekend. Maybe that'll do it, right, <laughs> for some of us. Anyway, <clears throat> okay. All right. Okay, so much of Jesus' time was devoted to ministering to the physical needs of the people. Peter summed up his ministry by saying, he's talking about Jesus, Jesus went out, went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. One day while in Capernaum, it was noised abroad that Jesus was in a certain house. The congregation on that day was unusually large, and the atmosphere was tense and expectant, and there were people there who needed help. And others were merely curious. The preacher, Jesus, was holding the attention of his fascinated hearers. He was always interested, uh, interesting because he spoke a language they could all understand. Suddenly, he realized that he was losing the attention of his audience. Their eyes had begun to stray to the ceiling where strange noises could be heard. Particles of dust and plaster began to drop. And then an object came floating down from above to rest on the floor at the master's feet. It was a bed upon which lay a wreck of a man who was so motionless that he seemed to be dead. The master's sermon came to an abrupt end. Four friends of this sick man had brought him to Jesus, but the mob within and without had made it impossible to reach the master. But they were determined to see him. One of the men discovered a way to get to the roof of the house and began tearing up the roof. Soon all four were working away at it, and when the opening was large enough, they lowered their friend through the ceiling until he was right at the master's feet. Jesus at once saw the courage and the faith that had made these men so persistent to see him. He also saw the supreme need of the sufferer. The man was paralyzed, but his paralysis was only a symptom 
of an inner disease. So this, this is a really cool story in the Bible where these, these, these guys have a friend who's paralyzed. And they're willing to risk. They want to get this guy to Jesus, but there's no way in. They can't get to him. And sometimes we feel like we just can't reach Jesus. Sometimes we're praying. Man, I've been praying for months, Lord, for this situation. I don't understand why this is happening to our family, why this is happening in our church or whatever. We're praying for a solution, for something to happen, for a good change, you know, because we're tired. And we just can't seem to get to Jesus. doesn't seem like our prayers are getting to him or nothing. Um, but this is why it's important to ha have other people in your church praying for you to understand your situation so that they can help you. Because basically, this is the same situation where if you try to do it on your own, a paralyzed man would, never, would have never been able to get to Jesus because he can't move. The only way he's going to get to him is with help from somebody else. The church, we are the body of Christ. And when we help each other, this is why it's important to come to church. You know, don't, don't let the world scare you away from coming to this church, the assembling together of God's body. We've got so much room in this church. If you're afraid of something, you can sit in a, we can put you in the back corner. <laughs> but you need to be in the presence of his people. In the presence where God's spirit is swirling about in this room. Yes, he can be in your home as well. We know that. But when you're in, not only in the presence of his spirit, but in the presence of his people, power begins to explode. Things happen. Par paralyzed people get healed. You know, sick people get healed. So, Rely on other people, not just your pastor. Your pastor isn't the only one that has to hear your, your problems and your issues. Yeah, he's our shepherd, but there are men and women in this church you can rely on. You can trust that they'll pray for you, that they'll be there for you in time of trouble. It doesn't have to just be our pastor. He can't do all that. There's no way. There's no way one man can do all that. You have to rely on your brothers and sisters in this church. That's what the body of Christ was designed for, you know. I mean, the Bible talks about it all the time, the body. I mean, are you a, are you a hand? Well, you're not going to be very good without the arm. Where's the arm in the body of Christ? Where's the leg? Where's the foot? Where's the head, the stomach? You know, we're all a part of the body of Christ. We're all a piece of that body. Amen. So you as a as a uh, <laughs> talk to your Bible <laughs> Bible study, your new converts, whoever you're teaching the Bible study to, remind them that they they are to, they are called to be a part of the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Sorry. All right. So so they let this guy down, um, and here, here's a, another important part of this story. This man was suffering. Jesus always saw into the heart of things. So, yes, this man was paralyzed, but listen to what, listen to what uh, happens here. As he looked into the face of this man, he saw a deeper trage tragedy, tragedy, than just his physical helplessness. Because what he does, he saw, he saw the awful tragedy of sin. Jesus saw sin in this man's life. He's a paralyzed person. But he just didn't see the physical uh, deformity or the physical problems this man was having. He saw sin in his life. And... Um, this man was suffering in his mind more than in his body. Jesus answered the prayer in his heart by saying, Son, thy sins have been forgiven thee. 
He was paralyzed. What does this have to do with sins? Jesus always looks on the inner heart of man before he looks on the outer. We look on the outer before we look on the inner. See, this is the problem. Jesus wants, he wants to heal us on the inside. Because if we're healed and we're strong on the inside, then he can heal our outside, the shell. This, this shell is, is dirt. It's going to go back to dirt. Right? It's nothing. It goes back to dust. That's it. It's just a shell. It's, it's holding the life that's in us that God gave us. That spirit. And that soul. And those are the things that God looks at. He looks on those inside, inward parts of us first. So he saw sin in this man's life and he said, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. He did that before he healed the guy. So Jesus was speaking of the deepest need, not only of this man, but every man. Forgiveness is the restoration of a broken fellowship. Forgiveness is the restoration of a broken fellowship. God wants to forgive us. He wants to restore that fellowship within us. And then he calls us to do the same. So if we have unforgiveness in our heart towards someone in our life, we need to allow forgiveness to be a part of our life once again. Because if we have unforgiveness, Jesus is not going to forgive us. If we hold unforgiveness as part of our life, Jesus is not going to forgive us. He says it. If you can't forgive, I will not forgive you. We have to have forgiveness in our hearts. So whatever it takes, if you have a situation like that in your life, get forgiveness in your heart. Go to that person, ask their forgiveness. And at that point, it's on them to accept it or not. You've asked for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. It's the, last, um, the last thing we want to do is let something like that keep us out of a relationship with God or worse. So forgiveness is the restoration of a broken fellowship. It means that we trust God and that he takes us back into his confidence. And I need to wind this up. And he forgets that, it, that we ever sinned. Not only did he say, thy sins are forgiven, but he also said, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way. Immediately the man was made whole, not only in body, but his soul was also healed. Jesus knew that the soul of man was so much more important than the physical body. But to show his love and mercy for our pain and suffering, he healed his body also. Jesus wants to heal you. If you're, if you're sick today or whatever, Jesus wants to heal you. And you tell that, tell that to your Bible students too when you're doing a Bible study. If you have an issue, God wants to heal you. He wants to make it right, right now. Don't say tomorrow. Don't say in a week. God wants to do it right now. Amen. This is the church service. It's not next Sunday. It's not Wednesday night. It's this church service. God wants to do something for you. Amen. But remember, it takes a relationship. It takes, it takes more than one people or one person's doing something. Amen. We have to do our part. God's going to do his part. Amen. Every miracle that you see, there's someone else does something and God does something as well. Amen. God's word is living. You remind your students, your Bible study students, whoever you're doing a study to, God's word is alive. It's not just words on a page. It's living. It is real. It's something that you, uh, when you have the Holy Ghost, you understand it. But um, you just remind them that God's word is real. It, it wants to put a fire in them. It wants to revive their life and all that. Amen. Next week, we'll be talking about um, the parables we're going to go through three of Jesus' parables, and that will end uh, uh, my teaching for a little while, I think. Maybe. I don't know. But anyway, someone else will be up here the week after that. But anyway, let's uh, stand and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Amen. I have a feeling God's going to do something great this, in this service today. Amen. Heavenly Father, you are a great God. 
I'm so glad to be serving you. I'm so glad to be part of this body, Lord. All these great and wonderful people you've brought together this morning. I believe there's going to be a great miracle in this house, Lord Jesus. That your Holy Ghost is just going to pour through this place. Sweep through the worship service, Lord God. And continue on through the sermon, Lord God. Through every word that is uttered in this service, Lord God. There's going to be healings, Lord. and There's going to be a gift of the Spirit manifest in this building, Lord. God, no, not only in here, but uh, even if it's online, there's going to be people filled with your spirit, Lord God. People healed, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity just to be in your house, Lord God, to feel your presence, Lord, to hear your word. God, just to be a part of your Holy Spirit, a part of your truth, Lord. Thank you for this time, Lord, we have together. And we pray, Lord God, your spirit would go out in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap.